Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA card uh, for Saturday, June 25th. And I apologize for those of you that were watching the, uh, the first version of this video before it got deleted. So we're going to be running this back one more time. Uh, I wish I could say I had incredible revelations from the first recording to this one, but that's just not the case. Hopefully it just goes a little smoother just because I'm doing it for a second time. First thing to note about this card is that it is relatively small. Uh, it is a 12 fight slate as opposed to, you know, we've been seeing a lot of 14, 15 fight slates. And that's important because your expectations for what you need out of your fights just can be, you know, ta ta uh, tapered or peel back a little bit. Um, where in a 14, 15 fight slate, you really want all of your guys to get hundred pretty much. In a 12 fight slate, it, it's sometimes good enough to just get the wins. So that's important when you go through a card like this, where you have inside the distance props, which are not particularly spicy. You know, we'll, get th we'll go through the, car the, the, the fights, but with the exception of one fight, there are maybe one and a half fights. There isn't a lot of just kind of lock inside the distance equity here. So uh, sometimes it's just gonna be good enough to get the wins. Um, so we are still looking for, you know, good finishing upside, good wrestling, grappling upside, uh, good win equity and, and all that good stuff. But, you know, we don't have to be as greedy with hunting for it. Now, with that said, uh, I'm going to probably contradict myself when we start uh, this first fight. This first fight, we have Jin Frey against Vanessa Demopoulos. You have a 2.5 to 1 favorite. In Jin Frey, who's priced as such, as priced as, uh, let's pull this up here. Um, sorry, let's pull up the DraftKings prices. You have Demopolis as 7K and Frey as 9,200. So when you have a $9,200 um, fighter, um, you need a decent either you know, win condition, uh, finishing upside, grappling upside. And Jin Frey has neither. I mean, this inside the distance prop is, is strikingly poor, you know, about two to one to not even finish at all. Not to mention the fact that Jin Frey has no takedown abilities, none, never mind the fact that she has no volume as well. So all of the things that usually comprise good GPP plays is, are absent from Jin Frey's side here. So I'm not going to play her at all. The more interesting piece of this fight is Vanessa Demopoulos because she actually does have some submission upside. Um, and Jin Frey also has some submission downside. So the two of those things together mean that if Demopoulos wins, it's very likely, I don't say very likely, but it's pretty likely that she gets the submission. And if she's 7,100 or 7K and gets a submission, I mean, and you have her, the slate is basically over. I mean, look, look I, I don't mean to say that you're going to win, but let's just say that if she does, in fact, get that submission at 7,100, if you don't have her, you're not winning. You know what I mean? You're, you're not hitting the optimum. Um, and remember, a 2-to-1 underdog or a 2.3-to-1 underdog wins about 30% of the time. So to, to really call it what it is, if you can say that 30% of the time this play is in the optimal, then you're going to you're going to be forced to play this in GPPs. And, and look, it's not 100 percent accurate. In other words, there are some variations where she wins by a decision. But I just feel as though those are very, very slim. Um, so I'm going to be playing Demopolis as or nothing as far as this fight goes. I'm not going to be playing Frey at all. Uh, moving on, uh, Batista against Kelleher. This one has an inside the distance prop of minus 125 uh, minus 105, which is not the greatest. So, you know, if you want to play this fight, I think that you want to either play the underdog or, or probably pass because the thing is that Batista really doesn't have that grappling upside to justify, you know, a, a $8,900 price tag, you know, that, that of, of a minus 165 favorite, right? Um, if he had the grappling upside, I would forgive the inside the distance prop a little bit. Um, if he had incredible volume, I would forgive the inside the distance prop a little bit, but I don't think that's his style and that's not the way he's, in, you know, he's hopefully going to win. I mean, he wants to keep it on the feet and just outstrike Kelleher, which he probably can, but that's not really um, conducive to high upside results of an 8,900 fighter. Now, as I said, 
maybe on a card like this, just getting the win is enough, but not at 8,900. I mean, 8,900, you really need to get the, uh, to get some fantasy points to make that work. I mean, if anything, what I would recommend is probably to play Kelleher in this spot because you have Kelleher at plus 450 to win by submission. And not only that, plus 550 to win by TKO. Um, as a matter of fact, if you really drill this down, you have Keller winning inside the distance plus 275, maybe like with the big plus 300. So what that means is about 25% of the time he gets a finish. So if 25% of the time he's going to get a finish at, what did I say? 7,500. That's again, that's, that's pretty good. So in this fight as well, uh, I am going to be inclined to, to, to take Kelleher um, and really none of Batista. So this is kind of the, the theme here is that I'm not going to really pick a winner of these fights, but just figure out the best GPP play from each fight if I'm going to play it at all. So again, first fight, it would be Demopolis and no Fry. Second fight, it would be uh, Kelleher and no Batista. Okay, uh, Cody Durden against J.P. Bays. So the inside the distance prop here is, you know, kind of poor again. It's a little weaker than the one before. But what makes this fight a little more intriguing is the pricing. You know, th this is the 8,200 8K price tag. So remember, we talked about this in the, in the intro here, is that it, it might be necessary to just get wins. And if you have an 8,200 fighter get a win or an 8K fighter get a win, maybe that in and of itself is not enough. In other words, if you, if you told me that if they win, they're only going to get 65 fantasy points, which is probably what they're going to get in a decision, maybe that's not enough. But because there is at least some inside the distance big here, you know, it's about a pick them to finish inside the distance, which basically means is that 25% of the time, either of these guys is probably is going to be in the optimal. Right. Because if you have an 8K fighter who does get a finish on a card like this, that's probably going to be good enough. So I think that the combination of the win equity of the 8K 8200 plus that that decent but not good inside the distance prop makes both of these fighters worth playing. So I would I would really make sure to include both of these fighters in your lineup. I have no real opinion on either of them. I think they both have the simple have similar type upside if they in fact do get the win. Um, maybe Durden's got slightly better wrestling. I, I don't even think that's fair to say. I think they're very, very equal. And whoever wins, I think you're going to want to have in your lineup. So uh, I, I would target both fighters in this, uh, in this situation. Now you have Morozov against Pava, and you have minus 140 versus plus 120. And as far as the... Um, as far as the DraftKings pricing, you have 8,500 versus 7,700, which is pretty reasonable. And we look at the inside the distance prop, and the inside the distance prop is not that great. Um, you have, you know, it's, it's all right, minus 140 to plus 105, so about a pick them. But Morozov does have a decent amount of, of wrestling upside, okay? So as a matter of fact, when you kind of break this down, I think that the finish, the finish uh, prop for Pava might be higher than Morozov. Let's just see about that. Yeah, so you have Pava winning inside the distance at plus 300. And you have Morozov winning inside the distance, not nah, plus 165. So it, so it is Morozov who is kind of the A side here. But I wonder if, Pava is fair at plus 300. I think it's close. I, I, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hedge a little bit. I definitely think that Marzov is the side I would prefer here, and I do prefer him, and I will play him. But I think that if you play enough lineups, you can get to Pava. I guess that's the best way I could describe this. So I definitely prefer Marzov in the spot in GPPs just because he does have both finishing upside and takedown upside, which is obviously something you're looking for. And I will sprinkle Pava in, but certainly not a priority. So TJ Brown against Shalyan. Um, I'll tell you, I, I went back and forth on this one. Um, originally, well, let's just, let's go through the analysis. So inside the distance prop, uh, very, very poor. 
you know, it, it's, it's favored to go to decision um, uh, minus 175 versus plus 130. And you have TJ Brown at minus, two, minus 200. So I'm really not particularly interested in the TJ Brown side of things. Um, what I had originally thought was that I wanted to play Shalyan because Shalyan does have a deep, have his entire path to victory is being able to out wrestle TJ Brown. Okay. That's really all he does. So if you break this down by the math, you know, if he's about a two to one favorite to, I mean, two to one underdog. So let's just say 33% of the time he wins. I do think that when he wins at the price of, uh, of 7,300, I think that's extremely strong. You know, um, I've heard a lot of takes that TJ Brown's style is going to be very difficult for, for uh, Sally to overcome, but I just can't help but say, you know what, that's all factored into the price. So if I'm going to presume that 33% of the time he gets his way and wins, it's going to be because he scores well with takedowns. And that's what I want at 7,300. So I do prefer him. Where I've changed my mind is on the other side. I was going to just not play TJ Brown at all, but I have changed my mind on this a little bit. And the more I dive into TJ Brown record, I do see that he has some wrestling takedown, top control abilities. And one thing I've, I've found is that when you have like a wrestler against a wrestler, there are two ways that it can go. One is that they, they just keep on like, picking at each other and nobody gets anything done. And it's a terrible busting fight. The, the other thing is if one wrestler is good enough to be better than the other one, especially when the other one has no other skills, if TJ Brown, in fact, is a better wrestler and grappler than Shalyan, he could really just destroy him. You know what I mean? Because if all Shalyan can do is wrestle, he has nothing else to fall back on. Um, TJ Brown can really put a beating on him and, 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 We've seen this before. You see wrestlers get on top and just start pounding away. Um, he can get like a he can get a really really big score here. Uh, so so I have changed my mind in my original video. If you ever had a chance to see it, um, and I'm going to include T.J. Brown in my in my my favorite list here. Um, okay, so in Chukwi against Olberg, this fight's a little annoying, and I'm I'm going to tell you why. Um, so. You look at the, first of all, you look at the inside the distance prop. It's, it's excellent for a card like this. It's almost minus 200. Fight doesn't go to a decision. The other thing that you look at is the pricing of this fight is, is, is super duper strong. You have Enchuki at 7,900 and Olberg at 8,300. So this is what you really are looking for, right? You have a good inside the distance prop and you have pricing as such that if either of them win, they're probably going to be the optimal. What becomes really annoying is that neither of these guys have a shred of takedown upside, a shred of control time upside. This is striker versus striker. And you're really depending on the finish to get this done. Um, and I thought about this and when I, when I go back to, I, I originally said that I'm gonna like play both sides of this fight and just lock it in pretty much. Then I start to think that maybe I don't need to do that because if this fight does grow, go to a decision in a striker versus striker matchup, it's not going to score very well. But then I remembered that it is only a 12 fight slate. So if that's really the downside of playing this fight, that, that one of these guys only gets 8x instead of 10, 10 or 11x, I think I'm willing to live with that on a slate like this. You know, so, so I am going to play both sides of this fight. Now, I will say, that there is a little bit of win equity uh, here. Uh, you have Nchukwe, who has drifted up to man, minus 120 in some places, and he's still being priced as an underdog. So, so he's got an incredible, well, incredible. He's got a really strong win equity um, uh, situation, uh, uh, win equity imbalance relative to the price tag on draft teams. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, that's going to be probably taken care of by the ownership. Uh, I, I've seen just an incredible amount of Nchukwe steam anyway um, in the DFS community. That plus the, the win equity is going to make Nchukwe extremely popular. 
So I feel as though what you're supposed to do is just play 50% of both these guys um, and just kind of roll with it. Okay, so we, we've talked about a couple of fights with pretty poor inside the distance props, or at least very pedestrian. Then you get to this crap show. I mean, you have Curtis versus Vieira. The fight doesn't go to decision line of minus 750. Um, the first thing I kind of want to say is I'm a, I'm a little... I'm a little tempted to try the other side of this one. Um, I'm a little tempted to try a decision here. And if I'm not, if I'm a little too greedy, if, uh, if that feels too greedy, if I can get fight starts round three at plus 200, I mean, that's, that's not bad. Okay. Because this, this is what, what's supposed to happen in this fight. Now, again, supposed to is, is whatever, but, but Vieira is going to come after Curtis and he's got a lot of submissions. He's got a lot of grappling. He's going to really, he's got a lot of first and first round uh, cardio and maybe some second round cardio. So he's going to come after Curtis and Curtis is a smart dude. You know, he, he knows what he's doing. And part of his modus operandi is basically taking, you know, letting the, letting the first round guy just kind of wear himself out and Curtis kind of take over later, even his fight against Phil Hawes. I mean, he was getting just destroyed in the first round. And even though he waited till the end of the first round and he clipped him and he took care of business. And likewise against Brandon Allen, I mean, first round was a little fishy, but then second round, he just kind of took over. And, and this is what he's kind of known to do over the last, you know, several years is just kind of take the guy in the deep water. And by the third round, just kind of just take over, which that, that leads to um, a couple of things. It, it leads to a, maybe an, an inside the distance prop that you want to take the under on. I mean, the overall, and you might want to take the, the route. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you might want to take the prop that says it's not going to enter round three. Um, with that said, uh, with this is inside the distance prop. You just have to play both sides. Of this. I mean, you just, you just can't avoid it. I'm not going to get tricky. I'm not going to get into, you know, one over the other. You just got to have to play both sides. Um, you know, I would go 50, 50. I mean, it's just all too likely that one of these guys finishes the other guy. And if that's the case, the pricing is such that they're probably going to be in the optimum or at least damn close. So uh, that's, you, you can't mess around with that. Um, Umar Nemegamedov, this guy is minus 1,000. <laughs> He's minus 1,000. And not only that, he has grappling upside as well. Uh, the only question is, is, is 9,500 a price that you want to pay? Like if, is his upside enough to justify a $9,500 price tag? And I believe that on a card like this, the answer is probably, you know, and the reason why I bring that up is, as I've been going through some of these fights, I mean, I've, I've been identifying some underdogs that I prefer over favorites, you know, like, like Demopolis and Kelleher and, and, um, and who's the other guy? Uh, I could play some Shalyan. Like, there are underdogs you can play here. And if, you know, on, on, in slates like that, I mean, I have no problem paying the 9,500 for the minus 1,000 lock, you know? Um, and there have been cards in the past month where you needed like 130 out of these guys to win. But I think on a card like this, just give me, give me the 100, you know, give me the 110, you know, give me the first or second round finish. And I think that's fine. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to probably, uh, I'm, I'm going to get a lot of that. And uh, no reason for me to play a plus one, you know, plus 700 underdog, not interested. Okay, uh, Moises against uh, Jagos. Uh, so let's take a look. We have an inside the distance prop, which is, I don't know, it's okay. It's like pick them. Um, let's, 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 let's get it, let's drill down a little bit. You have Moises wins inside the distance plus 140. I mean, is that good? Is that good for 9,200? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of more inclined. Take the underdog here. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at Jagos. He comes after it. He goes for, goes for stuff quickly. Let's see. Him inside the distance is plus 400. So that means 20% of the time. He's going to be the optimal. I don't know. I, I just, I think there were other, I think there were better, you know, I think there were better. I think that, oof. 
Would I prefer Demopolis? Would I prefer Kelleher? Yeah, I'm probably going to have to use him. Um, and with respect to, Mo to, 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 to Moises, yeah, I don't know. I mean, plus 140 to uh, inside the distance at 9,100. Um, sure. Yeah, I want to let's compare to TJ Brown for a second. TJ Brown is a worse inside of distance prop, but TJ Brown has that other variation I spoke about, right? Um, I, I just feel is that Moises does not have that kind of grappling upside to go with the kind of relatively poor inside of distance prop. So I'm pro he's probably going to be either a fade or, or, or an underweight for me. Um, this whole fight seems a little bit, a little bit fishy. Okay, uh, Parisian against Badeau. You have low-level heavyweights. This, this, the, the inside the distance prop here just really, really confused me um, a little bit. I, I'm going to get into why in a second. So you have Badeau is minus 120, Parisian plus one plus 100. It's basically a pick 'em fight. Um, but then you go inside to the inside the distance prop. You have Badeau winning. TKO is plus 165, and Parisians all the way up to plus 350. I mean, it's twice as likely that Badeau gets this finish than Parisian. And, and you know what? I mean, that's good enough for me. You know, I, I'm going to side with Badeau here as far as DFS goes. I mean, you have Parisian winning inside the distance plus 300, where Badeau winning inside the distance plus 150. I mean, for me, I mean, that, that's, that's fine. I'm not going to play Parisian. I'll just play Badeau in this spot. Then you have uh, Rachmanov against Bagney. And I mean, here we go. We have a minus 400 favorite. You have a fight doesn't go to decision. This is not, it's not that great. You know, when I first looked at this, I'm like, all right, just give me, give me, give me Rachmaninoff or whatever. But I don't know. I mean, he's got, you got him plus 140 to win by TKO, plus 300 to win by submission. Yeah, I suppose. Um, uh, I suppose it's a good looking favorite. Magni, no thanks, not interested. And then you have the main event. You have Gamron against Sarukian. And, and, you know, unfortunately, this is one of those you're just going to have to play. You know, it's a, it's a five round fight. Um, you have one guy who's a minus 300 favorite. And you're giving him five rounds to work with. It's pick him to not go, you know, pick him to finish. Then you have Gamron is going to be going for a whole bunch of takedowns. Um, I don't know if he's going to get them, but at plus 240, if he does get them and you got five rounds to, to play around with, he's just got to be part of your pool, you know? So I'm going to be playing probably the main event um, and probably play both sides. So let's just kind of review here. You know, I, I feel as though that these underdogs are pretty live. You know, I, I think Demopolis is live. I don't like Dufresne. I think Kelleher is live. I don't really like Batista. I like both sides of the Dirt and Bays fight. Uh, I like the Morozov fight and Pava probably an underweight. TJ Brown, uh, I, I do like both sides of this now, and I've drawn myself to TJ Brown's side a little more than I had before. I do like both sides of the Oberg and Chukri fight. You have to play the Vieira fight. Uh, I'm not playing any of Menez. Uh, Nurmaga Madoff seems fine to me, uh, even at 9,500. I think that the more I think about this fight, Yagos Moises, I'm probably going to end up fading this one. Uh, Badeau Parisian, for me, it's either Badeau or nothing. And then uh, Rachmaninoff or nothing. And I'll probably end up playing both sides of the main event. Uh, that should do it. Uh, good luck, everybody. I will be updating projections, hopefully, one more time. And, you know, don't, uh, it's a, if, if, you, if, you, if you lose, even if you have a loss on one of your guys, you get some takedowns. Like let's say you have Shalion and he got a bunch of takedowns and stuff finished late. I can see variations where where losing fighters win this slate as well. So don't uh, don't lose hope. Uh, that'll do it. Good luck, everybody.